Dillon, and I moved to Arrowhead in 1950. And, I, and I'm Sherry and Van um, I mean, I'm Sherry and Dillon. <laughs> and we're just, we're just going to give some stories to, tonight. Um, uh, growing up in Arrowhead, some of the things we did, some of the funny things, and the sad things, and uh, people we knew, and a lot of memories, and of our lifestyles, and, and how we entertained ourselves. And we didn't have, nobody had television or anything like that. And, and you know, I remember uh, Ricky Nelson playing on our radio, and it goes in and out. It's hard to hear the words, but your ear is right up there to get every little thing you can get. You know, we just. We, we lived in the big house and we had electricity and indoor plumbing and uh, many people didn't live in it still. They never did, they had kerosene lights and uh, we were very fortunate. Yeah, that's this, this little thing that I have is from, do you know, did you re anybody remember Wally and Daisy Johnson? So Wa Effie is Wally's sister and they had the house before we got it, yeah. And we we just loved our big house. We got pictures of it, but we didn't build it. Um, who built it? Newman. It was built for Newman in 1905. And then Harry Johnson's parents, uh, Jesse and Harry, moved into it, bought it, and then Wally, the son, and Daisy, and then us. Yeah. So. Um, like I say, uh, Daisy Johnson wrote this, and sh she wrote it, um, Halcyon Days on the Arrow Lakes. Um, the early days of my childhood were spent at the small village of Arrowhead, the Arrow Point at the head of the Arrow Lakes. This period was in the Halcyon Days of the Arrow Lakes and a very happy time in my life. Later in my teens, I was sent to school in Vancouver and was dreadfully homesick for the unstructured and free outdoor life of the happy days in Arrowhead. Summers were spent in swimming, boating, and picnicking on the lakes, varied with horseback riding and hiking. In August, much time was spent in picking fruit, berries, and vegetables for preserving and pickling. May and June were marred somewhat by the mosquitoes, unendurable to the casual visitor. But to the permanent resident, just a nuisance. Snowy winters were perfect for winter sports, skiing, snowshoeing, sleigh riding on the steep hills, and driving a horse-drawn cutter were all enjoyable for old adults and children. Spring was not a favorite time here. The melting snow would leave the roads a sea of mud. The horses were shedding their winter coats, which meant much currying and combing, plus cleaning of tack. On the favorable side, the apple blossoms, cherry, plum, peach, and pear as well were beautiful at this time of year and the wild yellow lilies were in bloom on the mountain at Easter. Autumn was the best season. The air was like sparkling wine. The mountain tops were dressed in their new ermine cloaks of white. The glaciers across the Columbia sparkled, their luster replenished by the early autumn forest, frosts. Overhead flocks of wild geese and ducks were flying south. The sound of the steel like whips of the duck's wings and the deep melodic honking of the wild geese seemed to me to be the very symbol of autumn on the Arrow Lakes. At this time of year, a faint mist rose from the lake at dawn, making for the early riser a vision of sparkling beauty as the rising sun shone through the mist to touch the dewdrops with the fiery light and the red of the maples to a new splendor. The moon seemed to gain in size and color in the period from August through September and October. An evening horseback ride along the lonely road between Arrowhead and Sidmouth with the great golden moon shining down on the river below was an experience that I will always remember. The Arrow Lakes were set in a long, narrow, jewel-like fjord surrounded by snow-capped snow -capped peaks. They were fed by the glaciers of the Monashi or Gold Range, the Rockies and the Selkirks, and are really a widening of the Columbia River. Mount Thor and Mount Odin are the two great glacier-covered peaks that stand guard over the Arrow Lakes at Arrowhead. 
Below to the right of our home, my viewpoint, the Columbia River emptied its swift and muddy waters into the calmer and more placid Arrow Lakes. Situated at the mouth of this great river where it widens to enter the lakes is Cottonwood Island. We used to play ball on that. This island was visited in the early part of the century by the Kootenai Indians. We watched for their long canoes to arrive on the shores of the island. They stretched their nets out from the island to gather in the great coast of the Kokanee, the small landlocked salmon spawning at this time. The Indians came for the last time in the 1920s, and one more picturesque event was gone forever. My parents, Harry and Jesse Johnston, my brother Wally and I lived in a large white house with a splendid view of the lake. Um, with a this is the this is the house in 1905. And these are the ones. And it wasn't painted yet. Yeah. These are the ones when we lived in it. And this was my painting of the house. We lived in a large white house with a splendid view of the lake from the upper and lower sun decks, orchards as they were called in those days. Our house was situated just under the 1,000-foot rock bluff of the 7,400-foot high Mount Sprout, a dangerous position because of frequent snow slides in the spring of the year. I remember sleeping in the bedroom and you would hear the rocks just tumbling right down, a little bit scary. And because there were some pretty big rocks there too. <laughs> from our dining room window and from the large porch in front, we looked down a 14-mile stretch of the upper Arrow Lake to Bannock Point. The moon rose over the Selkirk Range to the left and made a silvery path across the water, reaching the docks and gilding, you had to look that up, means an overlay with, with or as if, with um, a thin covering of gold. So, um, and, and gilding the ra railings and funnel of any steamer at the docks. So it was very beautiful to watch, see that. Frequently from our home, I watched the progress up the lake of the paddle, wheeler, paddle, paddle wheel steamer on its daily run. This was a lovely, lovely sight. The swan-like steamer showed white against the deep blue of the water, and the mountains echoed to the deep musical blast of the whistle. The paddle wheelers plied the lakes for many years from before the turn of the century until after the middle of the century. They carried supplies to the small towns and lonely farms along the lake. 